Hey there, Working Preachers. This is Matt Skinner, along with Rolf Jacobson. We want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to this fall campaign. We are happy to report that thanks to your generosity, we met our ambitious $50,000 goal and secured $10,000 in matching funds. So thank you. We know that you rely on this site regularly, and we are grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. We are incredibly grateful for all of you who chose to become or to increase your monthly contribution as working preacher sustainers. We truly appreciate your commitment to support this ministry monthly. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for this week, the third Sunday of Advent, which falls on December 12th, 2021. The first reading is from Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. The psalm is actually Isaiah 12, verses 2 through 6. The second reading is Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And the gospel this week is the third chapter of Luke, verses 7 through 18. And this is where we get uh, some really strong language. Yeah, John would have been a real fun guy to work with. It's like your co-pastor or something like that. John's great though. It's, this is this is such an interesting passage with you know what he's calling for, fruits worthy of repentance. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. looking for changed behavior. He's looking for mm -hmm. more than just sorrow or remorse. Well, but, yeah, and that it I think the hinge, the hinge question in this passage is is verse 10. Uh, the crowds asked him, what then should we do? And it's, that's our, that should be our question uh, on this third Sunday of Advent. Uh, I did a workshop on these texts a couple of weeks ago, and that's what I suggested, is that the title of the sermon is, what then should we do? Uh, that, that, with that recognition of God's in breaking into our, into our world, and that, these that bearing fruits worthy of repentance. If we think of repentance that we've talked about a number of times on this, uh, in this, in this podcast, that repentance is about a change of perspective of, of a changing of how you see things, then, then it does call for a, a, a way of being. So bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, is your the way you live your life? Does it reflect that you are seeing things differently? The way you move about in the world, the, the decisions that you make, what you do, does it actually, is it actually an embodiment of the fact that you have a changed perspective, that you have a change of how you see reality, that God's God is here and that God is present? And there needs to be a correlation there. Uh, and that's it, it, that might be kind of hard for people to hear. And, and it will be hard for people to hear. That's the other thing I want to mention um, on the front end is that I would add verses here. I would add verses 19 and 20 because, uh, because it, it immediately reminds us of the fact that these words, these call, the call to repentance and the, and the call to, to, uh, to see how God sees, which is another huge theme in Luke, to see whom God sees is going to be met with rejection. And so uh, Herod then uh, shuts up John in prison. And and this is a, and how is it that Jesus' first sermon will be received? Well, they'll want to throw him off a cliff. And so rejection is part of this. The resistance is part of this, of this reality. And that it, it might sound all well and good uh, to talk about the advent of God, but the reality is a lot of people don't want God that close. Uh, a lot of people don't go want God in their world, even though they might say that. And so I think that can be a theme of, of this 
third Sunday of Advent. It really follows uh, the um, uh, challenge of uh, the Malachi last uh, week. Um, um, I think it was Rolf that talked about the fact that this wasn't such a, a nice, wonderful um, uh, word that was being received. And so here is the demonstration of that, uh, as you just lined out uh, in John and will be uh, uh, in the voice of Jesus and therefore should be in our voice. Uh, the other reason uh, uh, that this will be hard to hear is is if we follow the way that um, uh, John speaks here, John specifically addresses uh, individuals uh, from, from different groups. So the crowds ask him, what then should we do? And then um, he describes um, to the tax collectors, um, to the soldiers, uh, to those who have. Um, it's a specific, it's not kind of this general be nice, um, it's like, okay, you have this practice of extortion, stop it. Um, um, you have this opportunity uh, to collect more than you should, stop it. Um, you have more than someone else, share. Practice hospitality, it's, it's, it's clear evidence of what that fruit uh, looks like. And it's also, those are things that are built into the system. So it's not just that he's saying, I know there are a few bad apple tax collectors out there and I want you to stop, but he's saying there are some systemic problems here. Yes. How are you, if you're a tax collector who stops taking more of your fair share of money, that makes it harder for all the other tax collectors. <laughs> if you're a soldier who's given up extortion as a way of padding your income in the Roman military, that makes it a lot harder to recruit other soldiers. It makes the other soldiers mad at you similar with two cloaks, right? You're giving up a sense of well, what happens to my current cloak. It's getting a little bit worn. What if it's a particularly cold winter, you know? Uh, and the coat makers don't like it when John says stuff like that, you know? So there's just to note that this is more than just saying, stop it, all you selfish people. But there are some systemic criticisms in here, which makes sense then why Herod would put him in prison, because this is going to be bad for business in the long run if this guy keeps exposing these systemic problems. And how relevant is that today when what we are looking at are systems of injustice, systems of oppression, and what does it mean to be the person, the voice that calls out those uh, unjust systems? Um, uh, and, and, and I think um, uh, of just uh, how difficult it is to talk about uh, practices, uh, police practices um, that uh, have uh, taken the lives of unarmed citizens. Um, to speak against that and to be that one cop who does the right thing. I, I think uh, uh, a couple of years ago of a police officer, it may have only been a year ago, of a police officer who actually apologized to the family of a person that he had killed going into the wrong home. And when he was at trial, there were no police officers present at his trial because he owned, he took responsibility for what he did. And in all of the others where they fought, they get behind the blue line and say, you know, if I don't take responsibility for me, my boys got my back. Well, in this particular case, this person was willing to say, I'm not going to follow the system. And what happened? It was so disruptive that the system did not get behind him. What a challenge for us. Are we willing to not follow the systems that have made our world the oppressive world that it is? It's not gonna win us friends, uh, but it will make us influencers. And this could be a really interesting place to invite in conversation or for a preacher themselves to engage in conversation with other people. It's easy, I think, to see John going after the the wealthy or the, the, the the exploiters that everybody knows are exploiters. People get to carry the weapons and collect all the money, but also to ask people about just business practices in their own lives, family dynamics. Where do you feel yourself being pulled into ways of acting or treating people because of your family system or because of your own kind of uh, business culture? What does that look like for you? Uh, just, to, just to name that these are temptations that, uh, well, that affect all of us. And as, as a preacher to spend time thinking about that as well, where are the places where I'm excused for using my power to 
uh, to gain more power or to exclude others or and and to be at least transparent about that with one's own self so that we don't make john just the one who's kind of the hero of the people who's got the the here are the clear villains we're clearly on the good side um there is some of that going on in this passage but but also to point out that that john sees society is broken and he's sick of the um the presumption right don't don't presume to say to yourself we have abraham as our ancestor right this is don't presume that you're whatever you perceive that advantage to be that that's going to save you um these are you know tough words are almost wasted on two weeks before christmas when <laughs> i'm thinking like yeah how do i get the post office to deliver my stuff faster but but important passages to think about what does it mean to prepare the way for the Lord and to prepare one's own self for Christ's arrival. And what a challenge, Matt, if it's not the corporation that I make the bad guy and preach against that corporation, but I ask the question of uh, who did I buy my products for, my gifts from, for the people that I'm trying to rush to the post office. It's not the corporation, it's my support of the corporation. Ouch. You're hitting a little too close to home there, preacher. Oh, okay. Maybe um, <laughs> somebody, uh, Caroline, were you gonna help us out here? It's Advent three, I came to church helping to feel happy, come on. Well, I was going to say that it also casts a very different uh, picture of baptism, that baptism here, you know, the ways in which we construe or have uh, denominationalized baptism uh, in certain in certain ways as to what it what it means and here I, I think another another aspect of it that's important about this text is to invite people to think about what what exactly is baptism in this context and baptism here really has a sense of the way in which it is a a, a new or renewed, if you will, allegiance to God. Uh, it is. It is. It is a. It's a way. It's a commitment then to a particular. It's a commitment to this kind of repentance. It's an. It's an obedience to God, and it's. Uh, so it's a different way to think about what. What does baptism actually do? Or what is it? What is it about here? And it really is this this mark of saying, I am going to, I am going to be different in this world. Uh, I am going to uh, examine, have a self examination of how how and in what ways I've uh, I have relied on uh, certain uh, certain benefits or certain realities. And but in fact, I'm called to a different kind of way of being because of the advent of God. And so. I think it's I, I that would be another aspect, and that, what you know that Jesus is uh, Jesus is baptizing you with the Holy Spirit. So again, it goes back to the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. To how is it how is it possible that I can bear fruits worthy of repentance? It's because I have the the, the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. I think I think that's an important aspect because the baptism of John with which he was baptized in is not Christian baptism. There's a difference both in, in the narrative and just historically. So, so how would you describe the difference between John's baptism of repentance and then Christian baptism? In what ways are they the same? In what ways are they different? Well, they both involve water. Oh, good one. Good connection. Both, oh man, I hadn't thought about that one. Thanks. Well, I would say, you know, the, I don't know if anybody cares about this today, but in the book of Acts, you've got disciples of John who were not baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so undergo a baptism. It's in Acts 18, 19, right on the, right on the seam, I believe between those two chapters. I, um, so that's part of, yeah, that's, that's part of what's going on as a Christian baptism gets changed. I would say following well, there's many ways that I think the New Testament describes Christian baptism, but following Paul, it's a participation in the death and resurrection of Jesus, which you can't really do in Advent. You have to wait for uh, Holy Week for that to, <laughs> and Easter for that to, to come into being. Um, but there is also a sense, I think, in which Christian baptism is 
is is a cleansing, is a washing. First Peter, I believe, helps us with that a, a little bit. That it does have a an image of purification, which is certainly what John's doing. But you're right, Rolf. It's not John's not baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Nor is John baptizing you in the name of Jesus Christ. Wasn't that um, one of the ways that um, uh, folks uh, acknowledged the God of Israel? Was was that a baptism? The baptism was it? What and be, you know, before Jesus, was it uh, uh, a repentance, a change of uh, of allegiance uh, to the God of Israel? Uh, yes. It, well, in some places, it was part of what a Gentile would undergo as a conversion ritual into Judaism, that there would be a, a, a dipping and immersion. Uh, they, Jews today probably wouldn't call that a baptism, but of course, as we know, baptism just means an immersion or a dipping. And so, so that it was there. It, there were also various, I mean, Dead Sea Scrolls, they washed themselves for everything. Uh, the, in the Qumran community, I'm not so sure that was that's the norm, but yeah, it's, 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 it's not just, I was in a conversation with students recently about this. And it, when there are these various immersion rituals, even in first century Judaism, they tend not to be about punishment. Like, oh, because you touched that stuff, you got to go do this. They're more about preparation. They're more about what do I need to do now to be ready to enter into the presence of God's holiness or to, um, a lot of these have to do as well with, uh, with, of course, childbirth and sexuality. Like, what does it mean to now enter into this new phase or this new place, or this new level of intimacy with a partner? I mean, all those types of things. We tend to hear it as you've done something wrong, you need to be washed or fixed. And I think it's it's better to think about what's going to happen next and what do I have to do to be ready for that physically, but in John's point of view, of course, also morally and uh, in terms of, of being in line with God's promises. That was not a good answer to your question, which is a lot simpler than my answer. Uh, actually, I appreciate both the answer and the question. All right. Do we, uh, we to, um, Zephaniah? Zephaniah, and um, I, I'd say that uh, context is important here. Um, I'm going to go all the way to back to the comment uh, that... Um, uh, Matt was making facetiously about, you know, oh, wait a minute, this is Advent, this is supposed to be good news, and it it looks like, oh, this is great, the uh, uh, passage from Zephaniah is this wonderful praise and rejoicing, and God has taken away, uh, taken the judgments against us, but context is, is, is really important. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time with uh, um, these prophets, and I know I've not spent a lot of time with Zephaniah, um, but what is happening here is that um, if, if you read the, the, the full um, um, uh, 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 prophetic writing here, you find out that um, it's moving from those outside of Israel being called uh, to judgment into Israel being called into judgment. And so the context is, is that you deserve this judgment. And I think it's important to acknowledge that before we jump to the, oh, great, God has removed our judgment. The prophet spends a lot of time calling out first. And um, good news only is good if, um, you know, you're not, you, you know, it's not a raise if you're already rich, you know, so. I still think it's fair to say this is my favorite part of Zephaniah. With good reason, yes. <laughs> Of all the parts of Zephaniah that I read, this is the one I always come back to. Yeah, me too. <clears throat> that is. One you that read I a read. lot of Zephaniah, right? Yeah, I, right. I'm. I, I read Maggie O'Dell's commentary, which I found also really, really helpful. Yeah, it added a lot to my my knowledge about Zephaniah. And about the Day of the Lord in general. <laughs> Ross, like you know, I've got a degree in Old Testament here, people. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay can i be a heretic for a minute sure i like it when you're a heretic yeah zeph and i didn't write these words so what yeah this is a deuteroisianic 
um, expansion of the text. Okay, listen, people, uh, send me the hate mail and the email, uh, or just ignore me. Just assume <laughs> I'm a heretic. Um, Why don't you tell them there's no Santa Claus next, Ralph? Go ahead. Okay. Oh, no. There's there's no Easter Bunny <laughs> or Tooth Fairy. <laughs> Somebody do not me. let your children listen to this podcast. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it, it's scripture, and it's um, it is pointing ahead. First, the day of the Lord. Oh, they thought that means not the second coming. It's the day when God's going to get active and and save Israel. And then the prophets, like Amos, came along and said, "Oh my God, brah, the day of the Lord's going to suck for you." Technical word that's used in the Bible, by the way. It's going to stink for you. Then. After it, that happens, Jerusalem is destroyed, taken into exile. Prophet comes along and says, oh, wait, the day of the Lord is going to be so great. And, uh, you know, so you get uh, the one part of Zephaniah that we uh, do have is this uh, vision of the restored community. All right. Moving on. Yes. And there is a Santa Claus, by the way, Virginia. So. Oh question for you matt uh, that i've never understood you're from california i understand right so you're going to know the answer to this question we all know each other out there Sa santa Small barbara state. santa margarita right santa is the feminine so why is it santa claus because i'm pretty sure whoever came up with the name santa claus was not speaking spanish oh dang it that's why you know why Speaking Ugaritic, originally Sinta Claus. Okay. Again, that was a deep Semitic language joke. We will there move go. on. What is Isaiah 12 doing in the psalm slot? Uh, it's, it's being an Advent text, uh, with, which is a wonderful text, I think. You know, um, uh, Again, the promise in the midst of very difficult time. Uh, this may also be an expansion of the text, but let's just assume it's not. Uh, I love this language. I suppose this is probably why it's here. Um, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you'll say, "Give thanks to the Lord, call on His name." I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great praise psalm. But that metaphor, I don't know of any other metaphor like that one uh, that I can think of in Israel's poetry about drawing water from the wells of salvation. Um, and I suppose it's there in connection then with um, all the baptism language, but it's lovely in its own right, uh, in the midst, uh, a promise from Isaiah, in the midst of a very difficult um, imperial invasion by Assyria. I would use it liturgically, <laughs> which I've been known to say. Have you, you've said that a time or two, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. We how about unpack that then? now? Don't you? You have to explain that. What? Well, we have new listeners. It's a new, new uh, church year. Really? Okay. Well, Where would you after the sermon? Is that what you would use this? Uh, yeah, I think it would be great after after the sermon, or uh, it would be. So, in other words, we'll use it liturgically. Where can you use it in the service? That's what I mean by that. And yeah, but to think about where where would it function as a good uh, as a response uh, to uh, could it be um, could it be I don't know um, could be the prayer of the day it could be a response to the sermon it could be uh, it could even function as the creed even so um, yeah I think I would use it homiletically ah <laughs> I mean uh, this would be a good refrain to come back to. Um, mm -hmm. Um, giving examples of people drawing water from the wells of salvation and, uh, and uh, helping people take that metaphor and imagine where they've done it in their lives and, and how it fits in daily life. Uh, all the experiences, I mean, verse two says, surely God is my salvation. God has become my salvation. Um, what that that's more than just forgiveness of sins and the promise of heaven. That's a much more active uh, sense of God's continuous 
delivering power in the midst of our daily lives. I appreciate that, Ralph. You definitely have me looking at this text differently. I, I, I've got to go play with that verse, um, that, that third verse. That's, that's, that's powerful. Um, Good. Maybe it makes up for whatever I said wrong about Zephaniah. <laughs> Let's go. What about Philippians? In the midst of all of this um, drawing back our attention to uh, the need for repentance, drawing back uh, our attention to uh, the anguish and disaster, um, again, makes it a powerful claim to say, rejoice in the Lord always. Um, And then here we have, um, again, examples of what those fruits look like, what it means to live out these practices um, uh, so that folks know you by your gentleness, know you by, uh, know God is near because of the practices of the people of God. Such a, uh, such a challenge for us uh, uh, to, in the midst of a season of expectation to put again into practice in the space and place where we are now, um, what is evidence of God's promise and presence and peace. I would use this liturgically. I would use this as the blessing. So Uh, at the end, I mean, it's a common ending to sermons. A lot of preachers out there and their sermons within peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I would use it as the uh, blessing or the dismissal for the end of the service. So this is where I set up Matt, who is uh, ironically our liturgical year ace. Matt, Philippians 4.4, rejoice. Translate that into Latin. This is the third Sunday of Advent. Oh, I see. Because this is uh, this is that special Sunday. This is Gaudete Sunday, and that's ah, rejoice. It is. So it, this it is, is where you light the pink candle. You light the pink candle. It's it's Gaudete Sunday. Uh, uh, in the traditional prayer of the day, liturgically, it's uh, that's the first word. Uh, it's called the collect, right? That that's the old word for the prayer of the day, the the collect. And yeah, rejoice. <laughs>